Welcome to Philippians, uh, as put by one commentator, founded on Paul's second missionary journey, which is in Acts 16. The church at Philippi was a source of real joy to Paul. Hearing that Paul was a prisoner in Rome, the Philippian believers sent a special love offering, and in this letter, Paul wrote to express his thanks. He also wrote to explain why Epaphroditus, uh, their messenger, so it is believed by some, uh, had been delayed, and to occur encourage the believers to work together to bring unity to the church. The overriding theme is Jesus Christ and the ministry of the gospel. Christ is the message of our ministry, you have that in chapter 1, uh, as well as the model of our ministry in chapter 2. He's the motive as well in chapter 3, and the means in chapter 4. So, the theme of joy is also woven throughout the letter. Despite his difficult circumstances, Paul rejoiced in the Lord and urged his readers to do so. After all, the joy of the Lord is the strength of the Christian service. And that would be in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Um, so, this is by far Paul's most personal epistle. The most personal epistle is the epistle to the, to the church at Philippi. No serious argument has brought, been brought against Pauline authorship. Historically, virtually all of the early church fathers to consider this epistle written by Paul. Moreover, Paul identifies himself and Timothy as the senders of this letter. Uh, so Timothy is at play here as well. Finally, Paul founded the church at Philippi during his second missionary journey, roughly around A.D. 51. Um, there are some disputes as to where Paul penned this letter from. If he wrote it while on house arrest in Rome and setting aside arguments from distance, uh, there could be plenty of opportunities for Paul to visit Philippi. Um, again, that is. So, furthermore, Paul urged an unnamed, quote, true companion to help two women that were in some sort of disagreement. So while somewhat speculative, this unnamed helper is, seems to be either Timothy, Silas, Epaphroditus, or some other friend of Paul's. Thus, when Paul calls the person commissioned with the task of delivering the letter to the Philippians, he uses the key verbiage, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier in the faith. Interesting, right? We are soldiers of heaven, uh, peaceful soldiers. We're soldiers of the gospel. Uh, we are to be spiritual soldiers against forces of evil. Uh, Ephesians 6 that we talked about in our last session. And uh, as such, being a soldier, you can even look at it this way. We're pro-life, you know. We're more inclusive and pluralistic as to who belongs to the human community. You know, the pro-choice community excludes the unborn as part of humanity. We include them. So in that sense, you can say that we're soldiers of the, uh, the unborn as well, defending them with our pro-life position. That word soldier can be taken in so many directions. So this certainly does sound like Timothy, though. Nonetheless, this unnamed fellow worker also delivered the Philippian gift uh, to Paul. Paul's love for this body of believers is very clear, like uh, we started off with. And as said before, it is a very intimate, personal letter. You can just feel Paul throughout the pages of Philippians. His attitude is one of joy and care, regardless of being imprisoned. Apparently, like I was mentioning, there was disagreement between two leading women at the Philippian church. Uh, so when he speaks of unity, including having an attitude of servanthood and humility, as seen in Jesus, you have that in Philippians 2, first 11 verses, Paul pleads for this church body to be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. That's in chapter 2, verse 2. So this personal and caring tone is not as evident in the other letters. Remember, Corinthians is more of a rebuke letter. Same thing with Galatians. Paul also stresses them to avoid legalism and to appreciate the finalization of the finished work of Christ on the cross. It is finished, he said. So Philippi also had a um, deep love for Paul. It was reciprocal. It was mutual. 
uh, this church was one of the few churches that supported Paul while in uh, missionary travel. Paul expressed his gratitude by calling their stewardship a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to the Lord. I love that. So he was very thankful, and, and the Church of Philippi loved Paul, uh, which is evident in them supporting him. Uh, thus, it's clear that the Philippian believers recognized Paul's apostleship and divine calling. You know, I got to tell you, um, sometimes um, when when I go somewhere to speak, I go, you know, to areas in Peru, uh, Lima, or Cajamarca, um, I, I taught in Montebelluna of Italy, and it's like every time I go, it literally ends up costing me money because I'm away from making money. And, and, and some of these churches or Bible colleges, they simply don't have the funds to get me there. And so I'll sometimes throw out the word, you know, if anybody wants to pitch in to get me there, um, that would be a great thing. Um, and to tell you the truth, um, support from churches uh, is very rare, you know. It's very, very rare. Tithing is down because of the economy and other things. Some pastors are being laid off because tithing is down. But, um, you know, I look at Paul when he went um, to various places on his missionary journeys. You know, he'd find the local tent maker and actually pick up a job, you know. And this is a trained theologian having studied under Gamaliel in Jerusalem. And uh, now he's building tent tents because he's also, he's got some skills. So, um, you know. My view is if, if Paul had to work and support himself from time to time, I can do the same, and so can you. Sometimes it's frustrating, though, frustrating because you, you, the doors are open. People want you to come. Peru wants me to come back. Uh, I don't know when I can go back. Seriously, I'd love to go back. Uh, some 500 people in that church, and they wanted the PowerPoints for, for, from the presentations that I was giving very hungry body of believers. You know, I get emails and they're like, listen, you have brothers and sisters here, so please come back. Very warm, just awesome, awesome body of believers at uh, Calvary Chapel of Lima in Peru. But anyway, um, Church of Philippi was definitely behind Paul and supported him as such. Now, as for Christology, the study of Christ, Christological doctrines that are set forth and defended in this small epistle, much theological ink has been spilt, attempting to understand Paul's words in Philippians 2, verse 7. The gr Greek word there is kenao, which literally means to remove the content of something. So having nuanced meanings uh, of the word include the idea of taking away something's effectiveness by depriving it of its power. Check, for example, 1 Corinthians 1.17. Taking away something, something's significance by destroying it, making it invalid or empty. You have that in 1 Corinthians 9.15. Or taking away the privilege of something's status. So there is no room for an in-depth discussion of all the possible meanings here, but the leading orthodox theories um, will be mentioned. So some have argued that Christ gave up some of his divine attributes. Remember, we talked about the hypostatic union and the diophysis, the two natures sort of being fused or hypostatically uh, joined into one being, if you will. Um, many different views there. You know, did Jesus have two minds? Did he have one mind? If he had two natures, wouldn't he have two minds? No. Some say the two minds joined and became one mind. Um, how is it then that he didn't know the day or the hour? Um, uh, did his divine mind certainly knew. His human mind may not have known. If you put them both together, you got schizophrenia going on. Right? Some philosophers and theologians would say, no, there has to be two minds. I go with the two minds theory simply because of this. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. If he's 100% God and 100% man, if I deny Jesus having a human mind, then I deny his full humanity. If I deny him having a divine mind, I do not divide, deny him his full divinity, so to speak. So 
But anyway, you can go back and forth, uh, very complex arguments in, in all directions. But um, the idea that he gave up some of his divine attributes in the incarnation, I don't go with that view at all. Uh, this view suffers from the fact that uh, for God, uh, the Son, the second person of the Trinity, to lose even one of his attributes is to lose his deity entirely. So others have argued that, Christ, uh, that, that Jesus gave up the use of his divine attributes. That's another view. Uh, this view also suffers from the theological problem that um, not being able to use an attribute is akin to losing the attribute itself. Um, attribute being a divine characteristic in this case. A third argument says that Christ gave up only the free and independent use of his divine attributes in the Incarnation. This view argues that Christ only made use of things like omniscience and omnipotence when it was the Father's will to do so. Again though, lack of use is not the same as, as um, not having the attribute, you know, so he would still possess the attribute, just not using it. Um, all of the above views also suffer from tending to for, forget the two natures, the divine and human, that I just mentioned. So both of those existed in the person of Jesus Christ, as well as attempting to use Philippians 2 verse 7 to explain how Jesus at times appeared to be less than the Father. A fourth view is that Christ um, taking on the human nature and becoming a servant involving uh, leaving his privileges behind, so to speak. The privileges would be rank and position. Uh, moreover, unlike the other views, it doesn't ignore the last view, nor does it downplay the hypostatic union that the Divine Son's nature and human nature were joined into one person of Jesus Christ, but without mixture and confusion. Um, that is all I will uh, say about Philippians, so I will go right into Colossians. Uh, Paul authored the epistle to the church at Colossae, and critical scholars only questioned his apostleship in the 19th century. Uh, regardless, Paul identifies himself as the author in this letter, and it is generally agreed that Paul wrote this letter right around A.D. 60. Uh, Epaphras was the founder of this body. His name is spelled E-P-A-P-H-A-R-S. Epaphras was the founder of the body of believers here and was also the person that Paul sent to deliver this letter. Moreover, the Muratonian fragment you should Google that, Muratonian Fragment, that's M-U-R-A-T-O-R-I-A-N, Fragment, which dates around 80, 180, 180 A.D., includes Colossians, so early for sure. This fragment also considers Paul as the author and was considered divinely inspired as an epistle within the early church. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures God breathed, right? Inspired by the Holy Spirit, profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness. That's exactly what we see Paul doing in some of his epistles, in particular to the church at Corinth. Uh, many modern critics claim that there are some 33 words used in this epistle, which is not evident in other established Pauline letters. Uh, yet in Galatians, there are some 35 words use that are not employed elsewhere in what scholars generally accept as Pauline. So if, if scholars agree that Paul wrote Galatians and there are 35 words used there that are not used elsewhere, well, certainly the 33 words used in this epistle doesn't exclude his, his authorship. So these words, whether common or uncommon, can easily be explained by the topics that he is addressing. It is customary to use different words for different occasions. Um, so, um, Pauline authorship uh, is for sure the case here, at least according to the early church. Colossians' use of a concise theological treatise uh, seems to refute the growing Hellenistic mysticism of his day. So, Paul... Uh, He's identifying various heresies that have crept into the church, 
And as usual, Paul also warned the Christian church to be aware of heresies and false teachers. The church at Colossae uh, were facing two main heresies on the rise. Early Gnosticism and then Judaizing. Remember the Judaizers um, arguing works of the law, the Mosaic law, uh, Gentiles should be circumcised, etc. And then you have early Gnosticism as well. Uh, Gnosticism didn't flourish until, you know, I would say mid second, third century and onward, onward, but it was like it is infant stage in the first century. Um, so Paul was arguing against that as well. While Judaizing uh, was more of a problem in the early churches throughout Asia Minor, the Colossians were facing Gnosticism. But, he, you know, repeatedly, Paul is literally warning all the churches because the letters were circulating uh, to be aware of both. Thus, as is customary in Paul, he reminds the believers that the law does not save, nor are we held hostage to the Mosaic law. Why? Because we are free in Christ Jesus. Now, since Colossians is a Christological book, chapter 1 in particular, um, one apparent heresy uh, seemed to have attacked the deity of Christ. Jehovah's Witnesses do the same today. Uh, thus, when Paul says Jesus was in the image of the invisible God, in chapter 115, who created all things, and all things were created for him, and all things were all things consist in him, Paul could not be any clearer in his Christological defense. Given the fact that this letter was authored around AD 60, also serves as great evidence that the divinity of Jesus was a common belief in the first century and not a later embellishment of the church, which is sometimes um, thrown out there, you know, you see it in Hollywood movies and so forth. Now, Paul also speaks of salvation in this epistle. He reminds its recipients that unsaved man is alienated and enemies of God. But through faith in Christ, all men are reconciled to him. God thus delivers believers from the power of darkness and sin, conveying them into the kingdom of the Son through his love and makes believers qualified to be, quote-unquote, partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Moving on to First Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica. After having preached in the Jewish synagogue for three days, Paul established a church at the port of Thessalonica. In turn, Paul sent Timothy back to ground these believers in the essentials of the Christian faith. Um, systematic theology, biblical theology, you betcha there were arguments for the resurrection, uh, arguments against Gnosticism, you know, and Timothy, remember he was young, he was taught well by his mother, and Paul says, look, don't let your age get in the way. Um, but the bottom line is, Timothy wasn't some ignorant youth pastor, he really knew doctrine. So as Timothy re returned uh, with multiple questions, Paul set out a reply. This is the reason for penning down the first epistle to the Thessalon Thessalonians. Then we're told that uh, uh, Silvanus and Timothy delivered the letter. Now, the city of Thessalonica was, was a great, um, large Macedonian city set, situated on the great highway uh, northwest of the Aegean Sea. Uh, making it one of the most important and wealthy trade centers known to the Roman world of that day. Due to its great location, Thessalonica became the main center or base for spreading the gospel in both Macedonia and Greece. You probably heard it put it this way. You know, when Alexander, which is prophesied in Daniel, right? You have the statue in the book of Daniel. And once you get down to, you know, the Medo-Persians and you get down to the through the Greco Empire, Alexander the Great, and then you have the Roman Empire, right? And then you have the feet in the Danielic statue uh, being mixed with clay and iron, which is the revived Roman Empire, and clay and um, iron don't mix. And now we have the eschatological view that as the uh, end time scenario sort of comes to play, um, the revived Roman Empire uh, will once again. Uh, flourish and you look at Europe today knocking down borders 
etc. I mean, me with my passport, I can I can move to Italy tomorrow and teach, uh, get a job. I could go to uh, uh, France, and it's just why are they doing so? To counter the eco economy that we have here in America. So knock down the borders, open up free trade, etc. Um, is definitely a sign of the Roma re revived Roman Empire becoming a superpower again, which is, of course, the United Nations, you got the European community, etc. But having said that, getting back to Alexander the Great, perfect, the perfect, um, the Greek language was so powerful, and when Alexander the Great conquered the known world of his day, uh, people started speaking Greek, and the New Testament is written in Greek. And then you have the Roman Empire, you know, beating, you know, have Greece, and then you have the Greco-Roman Empire, and then the Roman Empire. And, of course, the Romans built, again, trade routes and streets and just paved the way for trade. Best time in history for Jesus to be born of Virgin Mary best time in history because the language of the Greeks were in place, the roads were in place due to the Romans constructing all these trade routes, etc. So the gospel could just go everywhere. Perfect time in history for the New Testament to be penned down. So due to its great location, it became the main center or base for spreading the gospel throughout Macedonia and Greece. Setting aside liberal scholarship, Pauline authorship is not really questioned. It dates around A.D. 51 or so and is therefore considered to be one of the earliest letters written by Paul. Uh, so probably some four years, four and a half years before 1 Corinthians. Um, and um, the epistle to the Galatians might possibly be the only one written before Thessalonians, the first letter. Um, historically, in addition to the unanimous consensus of the early church fathers, including Irenaeus, Tertullian, uh, Clement of Alexandria, the Marcion Canon um, lists, for example, 1 Thessalonians is authored by Paul. Um, it is likely that Paul wrote this letter while he was at Corinth. Um, so, having said that... Um, Once Paul and Silas arrived in Europe, Thessalonica was one of the first evangelized cities by Paul. Uh, this was by divine appointment because in Acts 16, verse 9 and 10, we read that Paul received a divine vision of a Macedonian requesting Paul to come and deliver the gospel. So the Holy Spirit is definitely at work here. Uh, Paul first preached at Philippi, and then he evangelized Macedonia during his second missionary trip from 49 to AD 50. He then traveled to Athens, leaving Timothy and Silas there. Paul then traveled to Corinth, and while in Corinth, Paul received word from Timothy concerning the Thessalonian church, um, which prompted uh, this first letter being written to them. The fruit of Paul's preaching was tremendous in Thessalonica as a precursor uh, to, to, to founding the church, Paul's evangelistic message led many Jews and Gentiles to, do, to the faith in Messiah or Messiah or Christos. Uh, while the Thessalonian, Thessalonians were um, Jewish by majority, uh, Gentile believers were also plentiful in the, in the church. Uh, essentially, Paul wrote this letter in defense of his ministry and divine calling, which we've seen in the other epistles. Having been thrown out of the city earlier, he seeks to remind them of what he had done for these believers. Moreover, grounding this body in both faith and doctrine, not just faith, we need doctrine too, is also a theme that's emphasized throughout the epistle. Doctrinally, we see a heavy eschatology, uh, last age sort of message, soteriology, dealing with salvation, and triune, Trinitarian teaching uh, throughout the epistle. For example, Paul likens the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit with God in um, chapter 1, uh, verse 2 and 3, and chapter 3, verse 11. Paul guarantees that all believers are assured of their salvation by election and the power of the gospel. You have that in chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, concerning the last age or last days. Um, 
you uh, Paul lays out some of the most detailed explanations of the events of the last days in the New Testament. So read that in light of Matthew 24 and 25, where Jesus is is, is dropping some hardcore apocalyptic last day uh, scenario in that teaching. He directs believers to wait for the return of Christ. That's in chapter 1, verse 10. In hope and joy we wait, chapter 2, 19. The second coming will be with all of his saints. So yes, if we go home to be with the Lord, we're coming with him in the second coming, which is different from rapture. Uh, we haven't talked much about the rapture, but just for now, um, raptus means to be caught up. That's the word that's used in the Latin Vulgate. Uh, I would take it that, that most of you believe in the rapture. Um, we will be caught up uh, to meet the Lord in the air. To be caught up can't be the second coming. It doesn't make sense to go up and go down, right? Go up and then go down. Meet the Lord in the air and then as he's coming down during the second coming. So it appears that we will be raptured or caught up, Latin word raptus, caught up, um, meet the Lord in the air, but the second coming, all the saints of heaven are coming back, basically, to watch Christ judge the world, including what the world has done to the Jewish people. Um, so the second coming will, will be with all of the saints, that's in chapter 3, verse 13, and that he will come from heaven, heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, he's not an archangel, he will come with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. And then we read that the dead will rise first, which is in chapter 4, verse 16. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You have that in 4, verse 17. Yet, Paul also stresses sanctification. Paul says that the Thessalonians turned from idol worship to serving the living and true God. It's only one living and true God. That's in chapter 1, verse 9. He then goes on to instruct them on how to be sanctified. How to be sanctified? How do we do so? By loving others and avoiding sexual sin. Interesting. Loving others and avoid sexual sin. Certainly, there is more to sanctification than this, but um, these were probably the most important to Paul, given the nature of Thessalonica as a city. Um, I think we have actually some time left to get into uh, the second letter. So, yeah, we do. Um, this is Paul's second epistle to the church, Second Thessalonians, um, and serves almost like a follow-up type of, a, of an appendix to the first uh, epistle. The second letter was not written uh, too long after the first epistle, there was enough time for the first letter to reach the church and for Paul to receive their reply before he sent the second letter. So a safe date is somewhere in the late 80, 51, or early 52. Paul seeks to assure the church of continued opposition. Right? Opposition's coming. Be ready for it. The imperial cult of Cabirus, C-A-B-I-R-U-S, uh, was a cult, was prominent in Thessalonica, and to attack or critique it, it would be tantamount in attacking Rome itself. So, of course, you don't bow to Caesar, you don't bow to this imperial cult, and you're arguing Jesus resurrected from the dead in Jerusalem. you got another thing coming. Opposition will come. So, for this body to remain strong and steadfast, Paul assured them of opposition and perhaps some form of persecution. And that's what we have to remember. Rejoice in tribulation, knowing that it produces perseverance, character, and so on. So just like the first epistle to Thessalonica, no serious scholarly explanation has been provided that excludes Paul from being the author. Yet some liberal scholars conclude the second epistle to be a forgery, mainly because of four reasons, and you should know this. Why do the liberals argue that this is a forgery? One, the structure and form of both letters are too alike. Two, the vocabulary of the second letter is too close to the first epistle. Three, it is claimed that the second epistle is colder in tone and appears distant, whereas the first letter is more warm and personal. And then finally, four, the theological differences between the two epistles scream different authorship. 
So what can we do about this? These objections can be easily countered. For example, similarities in both letters are to be expected since they were written closely <laughs> to one another. So differences are to be expected. As for the first letter being of a more friendly tone and the second more distant is subjectivism at best. That is just a subjective judgment. There may be many reasons for why uh, they are written differently. Uh, Paul is more corrective in his second epistle, specifically concerning the Thessalonians' view of eschatology, study of the last days. In any event, for our purposes here, uh, there's not enough time to deal with all of these details. However, it should be noted that one critique is that Second Thessalonians, the teachings on the second coming, um, some argue, contradicts those in uh, First Thessalonians. Uh, this may be explained by a different topic being introduced. So, uh, while 1 Thessalonians deals with believers being prepared for the sudden appearance of Jesus, being prepared for the sudden appearance of Jesus, 2 Thessalonians discusses things that will happen just before Jesus appears. So, being prepared before the sudden appearance of Jesus is different from the second epistle where he discusses things that will happen right before Jesus appears. So apparently, um, there were believers within the body uh, at this church in Thessalonica that believed they lived in the last days. In fact, uh, some of the Christians had even gone so far as stopping working, right? The Lord is coming tomorrow, so I'm going to quit my job. You know, you see cults do the same thing, <laughs> right? Sell our house, you know, or people who believe in alien abduction, let's sell everything, go in the desert and wait. And they're made to look like fools in the end. So, uh, Paul was quick to correct this misunderstanding. You know, the last age began, folks, at the ascension moment. God is timeless, so we're just as close to the second coming as they were, if you think in a timeless uh, way. All right? That is not to say that prophecy is not being unfolded before us. I believe uh, Israel uh, coming back into the land is definitely pro prophetic. So, Keeping an eye on Israel, you can sort of gauge, um, I think, somewhat safely um, that we are living in the last age of the age, if you will. At least I would like to think so. But you've got to remember, every single generation throughout the church has thought they were living in the last days. So we must be careful not to read the newspapers as it's being pr prophetic. You know what I mean? Newspapers can stretch stories, right? Newspapers oftentimes propaganda. We can't interpret prophecy through the lenses of American sunglasses. You know what I'm saying? You can't do it from a Swedish perspective. So I think by focusing on Israel alone, like Jesus refers to, you know, you look at the trees, and when you start seeing buds appearing, you know that the summer is near, etc. Um, but uh, we must be careful as teachers not to be complete whistleblowers and definitely not set dates. No one can set the date for the second coming. It's, that would be the sign of a false prophet. Don't do it. No one knows the day of the hour, period. So getting into numerology and trying to calculate all these things and, you know, you just end up being lost. And it's, it's not a fruitful study. could be interesting, but it's not worth teaching. Um, so Paul was quick to correct this misunderstanding. Then Paul goes on to set straight Christian eschatology and argues that the man of sin, who is the Antichrist, is yet to be revealed. He writes that there will be a falling away before Christ appears, thus the lying signs and wonders that are performed by the man of sin and yet future. Now let's stop there for a second. Um, the Antichrist will perform lying signs and wonders. They are not miracles. Only God can perform miracles. So let's nail down a definition. I'm sure I mentioned it before. Uh, supernormal is what demons do. Supernormal activities. God does the supernatural. He's a supernatural being. So a miracle is an act of God. Therefore, demons cannot do miracles or perform miracles because they're acts of God. So at best, these lying signs and wonders are supernormal experiences. 
not supernatural. They are lying signs and wonders. We're, 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 for example, we're told that um, the Antichrist will you know, take a deadly wound to his head. It's going to rise from the dead. That's copying the resurrection. That is not a real resurrection. At best, it's a resuscitation. You know? And remember, too, that you know, demons, uh, the Antichrist, will for sure be able to manipulate matter. Manipulate matter. Uh, they call that um, diabolic infestation, you know, moving stuff around, shaking a bed, uh, slamming doors, you know, flushing a toilet upstairs, and you're downstairs, you know. Uh, weird accounts like that coming, come, come, coming throughout. But when you look at Moses throwing down his staff in front of the Pharaoh and it turned into a serpent, the pagan priests did the same thing, but they were not real serpents. They were throwing him down manipulating matter. It was clearly satanic of the occult. And of course, who wins? Well, Moses' serpent swallowed the others. So they were engaging in the supernormal. Moses was engaging in the supernatural because God was working a miracle through the staff of Moses. Same thing with the part of the Red Sea, right? And uh, striking the rock, of course, which he shouldn't have done in anger, but giving water to the Israelites in the middle of the desert that is also a supernatural act. So, having said that, apparently there were believers within this body that believed they lived in the last days, as I mentioned. Uh, there's going to be lying signs and wonders. Uh, you, you, you're you not living in the last days un unless you are close to the man of sin being revealed. That's the Antichrist. And we believe that we will be taken out of here before the Antichrist shows his faith shows his face, so to speak. I believe he's going to come out of the revived Roman Empire, be a European leader, um, and of course he's going to prevent, uh, propose a peace plan to, to Israel in the Middle East, and the whole world will marvel, thinking, oh my goodness, how could you come up with this peace plan? And people will just start, you know, almost worshiping him. And then, of course, you see the true colors of Lucifer, you know, the first Satanists were the fallen angels who worshipped Lucifer. Those were the first Satanists. So he likes worship. He only demanded worship to Christ. Remember that. Nowhere throughout Scripture do you see him demand worship until he's in Jerusalem tempting Jesus, bow to me and I will give you the kingdoms of this world. Interesting that he would sort of tempt the Son of God in his frail human nature, having fasted for a long time, really, really weak, says, worship me. The first command was to the Son of God to worship Lucifer. Crazy stuff. Of course, Jesus didn't. But the Antichrist will walk into the temple, the third temple. There's four temples. You have the Solomonic temple. Then you have the Herodian temple that was being rebuilt uh, during Jesus' life. And then there's a third temple that unbelieving Jews, meaning non-Messianic non Jews, Jews that are not believers in Jesus, they will build the third temple. The fourth temple is the one that Messiah himself will build, be built coming out of heaven. You know, that is way bigger than the Temple Mount. You know, if you look at Ezekiel's dimensions, and I believe that's a literal Messianic temple. So four temples as far as eschatology goes. Um, Paul then teaches the Thessalonians about uh, the correct view of predestination and divine election. And he says that, uh, that God from the beginning chose you for salvation. That's in chapter 2, verse 13. Um, this short statement is important in realm of predestination and election because it shows that God is the one who's doing the choosing and doing so prior to anything the believer does. So before the foundations of the world, right, Christ was already slain. Um, before God says, let there be light, before he created the universe in Genesis 1, you already existed as an idea in the mind of God. You know? So take that to heart. He predestined you and foreknew how you would freely choose in the future. Romans 8, 28 through 30. Uh, in all, Paul set straight any misconception or misrepresentation of his teachings concerning the day of the Lord. Uh, the day of the Lord, meaning the second coming. He refutes the false teachers 
that may uh, have misquoted him in his first letter. You see that in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 2. And uh, he encouraged them to persevere for the day of the man of sin to be revealed, which is yet future. That wraps up 2 Thessalonians. I said things are going to come fast this week. And uh, we were off for a slow start. By the way, uh, feel free to sign up for Genesis. That's going to be a long book, and we're going to go really fast on that in the next semester. I think the school is also offering a discount. So by all means, take advantage of that. I'm finishing uh, Genesis at Calvary Chapel Bible College at Chuck Smith's Church, Costa Mesa. And uh, I will be using the same information, just more in a summarized way, because uh, we go four months there, three hours a week. Uh, so it's kind of hard to do that uh, in this setting. But it will be interesting, that's for sure. Talk to you soon. Lord bless, and uh, be blessed in your studies.